entrepreneurs, business owners, professionals who seek excellence, bringing the business classroom to you. It's the Business Builder Show. Here's Marty Wolf. We still got it. Welcome to the Business Builder Show with Marty Wolf, the show for entrepreneurs, business owners, and business leaders. I'm Marty Wolf, your host for the Business Builder Show, and along with my executive producer, D.C. Taylor, we will be your guides on this learning journey. Let me tell you my super objective in being with you today. I want to enthusiastically share stories and information to inspire leaders. And that's you, by the way, so you can inspire others. My special guest with me today is Safi Bacall. Hi, Safi. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. I read your book, which is titled Loon Shots, How to Nurture the Crazy Ideas that Win Wars, Cure Diseases, and Transform Industries. Wow, what a great book. (laughs) Fantastic book, Safi. (laughs) <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for saying so. <laughs> yeah, really great. So let me do an introduction. Safi Bacall is author of Loon Shots, How to Nurture the Crazy Ideas that Win Wars, Cure Diseases, and Transform Industries, is a second-generation physicist, in parentheses, the son of two astrophysicists, and a biotech entrepreneur. He received his BA, summa cum laude, from Harvard and his PhD from Stanford, after working for after working for three years as a consultant for McKinsey, he co-founded a biotechnology company developing new drugs for cancer, also in parentheses next, which led him to be profiled by Malcolm Gladwell in The New Yorker. He led his IPO, he led its IPO, and served as a CEO for 13 years. In 2008, he was named ENY's New England Biotechnology Entrepreneur of the Year in 2011, he worked with the President's Council of Science Advisors, in parentheses again, PCAST, on the future of national research. Wow, what a background, and I saw all that education and all those insights in the book. So, Safi, again, welcome to the Business Builder Show. Loon Shots is the title of the book. Okay, let's get started. You define that for me. Well, everybody knows what a moonshot is. It's a big goal, a destination, something like curing cancer, eliminating poverty. But if you look back at history, the big ideas, the ones that have changed the course of science, business, or history, rarely arrive with blaring trumpets or red carpets, dazzling everybody with their brilliance. They've usually been neglected or dismissed for years or sometimes even decades. Their champions written off as crazy. Mm. Since there wasn't a good word in the English language for that, I made one up. (laughs) And and you know what? It fits. It really fits. Great job. So uh, what were the, when when or how were the seeds planted that got you so interested in in studying what you call loon shots or we'll call them breakthroughs? Where did all this start? Well, I was uh, after I started a biotech company developing new drugs for cancer. About that was probably about f- uh, twenty years ago now, and uh, not long after I started, my father got diagnosed with a rare type of cancer, and I was um, I tried everything I could since I figured I was in the industry, I could make a difference, but unfortunately, I couldn't. He died very quickly after he was diagnosed, and over the years, I got to be more and more surprised and frustrated that there were all these, what seemed like promising ideas and projects sitting in the basement of either large companies or small companies, it didn't matter, but they were just stuck there. And I was wondering if there was something better that we could do to help liberate those projects. And Hmm. I think the, uh, you know, when I first started and I would read about how to design great teams or great companies and I read everything I could find when I was beginning as a manager, and it was almost always about culture, culture, culture. Mm-hmm. Mm. But I uh, I grew up with a kind of a hard science background, and after a while, I would hear culture, 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 and I would just think yogurt. <laughs> uh, let me let me repeat that. You would think of culture, and you would say think yogurt. Yeah, you know, it's just <laughs> sort of soft, squishy stuff. And, <laughs> 
you know, I, I wanted, I was looking to see if there was some more hard science about how we could design teams or companies or organize people better to do a better job of liberating those products that might be stuck inside large groups. And around that time, I got a call to work with President Obama's uh, Council of Science Advisors on the future of national research. And I, uh, in, the, in the course of the work for that, I stumbled across the work of a guy named Vannevar Bush, who I'd never heard of. Mm -hmm. But he was a guy in the late 1930s who was an incredible innovator and uh, inventor and engineer. He was head of engineering uh, actually, the number two guy at MIT, just uh, the vice president there, dean of engineering. And during the uh, beginning of the war, he recognized that the U.S. was far behind Nazi Germany and the technologies that would be critical to winning the war. In fact, some early technologies were buried in the mm -hmm. labs, in these military research labs. Mm -hmm. So he quit his job, talked his way into a meeting with President Franklin Roosevelt and gave him one sheet of paper, 10-minute meeting, four paragraphs in the middle. And that 10-minute meeting changed the course of the war more than any other similar mm -hmm. meeting. And what he did during that 10-minute meeting and over the next few years, I realized, was invent a new system for innovating enormously fast, for getting out these sort of stuck projects that are buried inside large groups or large companies. And I realized that it had enormous enormously interesting implications for how we design our workplace today. It mm -hmm. gave me a whole set of ideas and a whole new set of tools and techniques for thinking about how to design better teams and companies. And so that mm. kind of led to the research for this book. Well, you refer to a gentleman by the name of Mr. Bush also, not the one that somebody will think of, but uh, talk to me about that and how that connects to uh, weaves into your story. So Vannevar Bush was the guy who came up with this system. And what he told President Roosevelt, FDR, at that meeting was, there's a war coming and we're going to lose that war. We have this phenomenal military and right. uh, they just, we need the culture of the military, the tools, the technologies, the people there, but it's not designed for the kind of radical breakthrough innovation that we need to design the technologies that will make a difference. Right. And so he said, I want to propose that we create a new group inside the federal government that will report directly to me and I will report only to you and I will mobilize the nation's scientists for war. And that's what he did. So and he came up with. Yeah, go. Ahead. No. So um, I, and I kind of I, I, I made a mistake. So I under. OK, I got that. There's also a gentleman by the name of Vale. And uh, Bell Labs, I think, where does he enter into the story? Or is this an appropriate time to introduce that concept or that person into the story? Sure. So the system that Bush invented, which ended up, in fact, during the course of the war, making a big difference, was not original to him. It sounds like something that could be relevant to the business world, even though he applied it to the military. And in fact, the idea for a system where he sort of separates his artists or scientists working on crazy ideas from his soldiers and does a handful of techniques to design a system and a structure that works very well for innovating, that idea, that system, those principles had been developed earlier by a man named Theodore Vail. Mm -hmm. And he was brought in just like Vannevar Bush he was brought in to rescue a franchise in crisis. Mm -hmm. Bush was brought in to rescue the U.S. military, which was phenomenal at franchises and guns and planes and ships, but was struggling to innovate. Theodore Vail was brought in to rescue a different franchise in crisis. In fact, the largest franchise and company in the United States, and that was a company called the Bell Telephone Company. Right. They had this dominant monopoly with Alexander Graham Bell's patent on phones, and that patent had expired, and all these little competitors were starting to eat Bell Telephone Company's lunch, and the management at the time and the board at the time were just sitting there collecting the royalties from Bell's right. patent right. and not doing anything. And so a guy named J.P. Morgan bought up the stock of the Bell Telephone Company, threw out the board, which was these sort of wealthy Bostonians, and brought in a man named Theodore Vail. And Vail 
said. He made an announcement. He came in around 1907. He made an announcement. He realized that the company was in a decline and it was on its way down. And the only way to bring it back was to create a reason that this giant company should exist. And he told the board, he told the public, he said, we are going to create one company, one system, one service. You're going to be able to call from New York to San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And at the time, that was a radical step because, mm -hmm. you know, phone calls, you know, from town to town barely worked mm -hmm. because the idea of nobody really understood how electrical signals traveled. You'd have to remember that the electron was just discovered a few years earlier and quantum mechanics, which helps understand why these signals degrade, wasn't even invented yet. Hmm. So what he told the board of directors, he said, we have to create technologies that have never been invented based on science that is not yet known. And I want you to authorize me to create a quarantine group of scientists who are going to work on developing this cutting edge knowledge. And that was the birth of Bell Labs, yeah. which wow. eventually gave us the first vacuum tube, the first amplifier, the first transistor, eight Nobel prizes, the laser, the first solar cell, the first CCD chip, all these great Amazing. inventions. Yeah, amazing. And yes. the, the research and how you put all this together was, was and is amazing in the book. Uh, my guest is Safi Bacall, S-A-F-I, B-A-H-C-A-L-L. -L. His book is Loon Shots, How to Nurture the Crazy Ideas that Win Wars, Cure Diseases, and Transform Industries. I guess kind of the main thing that this is based on is something called phase transitions. Is it okay to ask that question right now to explain that? Maybe that we can go from there. Sure. I'd ask you to do something which sounds a little crazy, which is to imagine a glass of water. It sounds a little wacky when talking about businesses, but bear with me. Imagine a glass of water. You stick your finger in the glass of water and you can slosh it around. And that's true for any liquid all the time, except as you gradually lower the temperature, all of a sudden the behavior of those molecules will completely change. Why? The molecules would go from sloshing around to being completely rigid, frozen like ice. But why? It's exactly the same molecules. So how do they know to suddenly change their behavior? There's no CEO molecule sitting there with a bullhorn saying, "Every okay, everybody, it's 33, so everybody slosh around. Nope, now it's 31 degrees Fahrenheit, so everybody line up rigidly. Mm. Yet they know to suddenly change. And so it was what I do in the research in the book is show not only qualitatively but quantitatively how understanding that sudden change, which is called the phase transition in science, helps us understand the sudden changes in groups of people, why they will suddenly change from embracing wild new ideas to rigidly rejecting them. Hmm. And once we understand those transitions, we can to control them. We can begin to manage them for the behaviors we want. For example, when it snows at night, what do you do? You sprinkle s salt on your sidewalk. Mm hmm why? Well, it turns out it lowers the stickiness of the molecules. It lowers the binding energy. It lowers their tendency to want to lock up, which makes, makes them slosh around longer. It lowers the freezing point. There are all these small changes in structure, once you understand that transition, that help you manage that behavior. Hmm. So in the book, I help go through I go through some examples of what are those small changes in structure. And here's why it's so important. Fixing culture is hard. Fixing, you know, just getting people together and watching mm -hmm. two-hour videos and singing Kumbaya and holding hands mm -hmm. doesn't do much. <laughs> Correct. Right. I would agree. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. And it's just like if you have a block of ice, yelling at those molecules or pleading with them to loosen up a little doesn't do much. But – a small change in temperature will get the job done. A small change in temperature can melt steel. And so that's why it's so important. Culture, you can think of as these patterns of behavior. Structure are the small changes that drive those patterns. Hmm. Phase transitions, put it to me or answer me this or give me more information on this. And as a general statement, I could see the small companies um, – being very high energy, energetic, 
uh, focused on a goal, uh, just getting the job done, just thrilled to be there. And then on the other hand, I can see these well-established bigger companies uh, maybe focused on hmm, their rank or their position or their salary. Is that connected in some way, what I just said, to, to your book? Yeah, absolutely. We can think of any phase transition in nature, any one of these sort of sudden changes of a large system as ultimately being due to the competition between two forces. So, for example, in a glass of water, one force wants to lock molecules rigidly in place. It's called binding, binding energy, but that's just a fancy word for let's lock each other, let's lock these things rigidly in place. Another, the other force is entropy. Again, just a fancy word for let's everybody run around and be free. <laughs> and as you gradually change temperature, the relative strength of those two forces changes until boom, at 32, entropy loses and binding energy wins and everybody locks down. Mm -hmm. And that's essentially every phase transition in nature in 90 seconds. Now, what could that possibly have to do with people? You know, pe aren't people much messier or more complicated? Well, that's the idea behind what's called emergence, which is these properties of the whole that don't depend on the details of the parts. Mm -hmm. So what I told you about water is true, but it's true for every liquid. It's mm. true for carbon or methane. All of them slosh around at higher temperatures and freeze at lower temperatures. And it's true, another example is if you're driving along on a highway. There's one, there, you, people want to cruise at their ultimate speed, but they also don't want to crash into the car mm -hmm. in front of them. That's a tension between two forces. And when you gradually change conditions on the highway and you actually cross to a certain dense through a certain density, you know, around 4.30 or 5 o'clock on the highway, all of a sudden you switch from smooth flow to jammed flow. Even though the drivers and the cars are different, one might be a, tour, a Ford, one might be a Toyota. So what does this have to do with teams and companies? All people are different. Well, there are certain properties of the whole. Mm -hmm. innovating, innovating well is a property of the whole. It's not an individual behavior. It's a property of the whole group or team or company. Mm -hmm. It's embracing wild new ideas. And whenever you bring people together into a group, you create two forces. And people really haven't thought about this or paid enough attention to this because it's mm -hmm. so important. It's the key to understanding how to unlock the potential of groups yeah. to innovate better. Whenever you bring people together into a group, you create two forces. What are they? The first is stake and outcome. Here's what I mean by that. If you bring five people together to, let's say, develop a new cancer drug like I did in a biotech company, your stake and outcome is enormous. Mm -hmm. If the drug works, everybody's a hero and a millionaire. If it fails, everyone's unemployed. The second force is perks of rank. So, for example, when you have five people, you're probably going to need one person to be the team captain. Okay, sure. The other people are the team members. But does that perks of rank matter very much? Not really. Not if you're five people. You know, maybe the, mm -hmm. the team captain gets a little bit more money. But when you're small, those stake and that stake and outcome is enormous and the perks of rank are almost irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Now, when you're, let's say, 10,000 people, well, you're, the project you're working on might be a tiny fraction of a percent of the total revenue. You know, even if you make a $100 million drug, if your company is selling 10 or $20 billion, that's tiny. So your stake and outcome is very small. On the other hand, if you could get promoted from a team member to a vice president to a senior vice president or executive vice president, each time you go up, you could get a giant bump in salary. Mm -hmm. So now when you're larger, all of a sudden, perks of rank are bigger. Mm -hmm. Somewhere between the two, there's a transition. And that helps us understand why companies will shift from embracing wild new ideas when they're tiny to rigidly rejecting them when they're large it has nothing to do with the people, just like the molecule in a glass of water isn't saying, you know, I feel like a liquid molecule or I feel like a solid molecule. It's the same molecule. It's hmm. just the system and structure around that molecule is changing. Strong case for culture. I guess I'll use the word versus structure. Um, group size. You address that. Um, does it matter... Talk to me about group size, the way you talked about it in the book. Sure. There's a, there's a number of things once you start to think about 
the behavior of teams and companies in this way, there's a number of things that kind of come out right away. And the first one is we have a big problem. And the big problem is a system can't be in two phases at the same time. A glass of water can't be solid and liquid at the same time. So if you have these two forces and you can only be one or the other, solid or fluid, that means that a group or a team can either be innovative or it could be rigid, but it can't be both at the same time. Mm-hmm. Now, for example, we talked about Vannevar Bush who helped uh, turn the course of World War II. Mm-hmm. So to come back to that example, when he arrived to meet with President Franklin Roosevelt, he knew that he not only he couldn't change the military culture, he shouldn't. You actually want that rigid structure. Mm-hmm. If you are need to make a million guns and build thousands of planes and thousands of ships and direct millions of soldiers in battle across four continents, you really want a very rigid, disciplined, hierarchy-driven system and processes to make sure things get done on time, on budget, on spec. Mm-hmm. But here's the problem. To survive, the country needed to do both. It needed both the rigid discipline of execution and operation and operational excellence and the crazy wackiness of radical innovation. Mm-hmm. It needed both. Mm-hmm. Now, we just said you can't be solid and liquid at the same time, so what's the answer? Well, the answer is there's one exception to that rule, and the exception to that rule is right at 32 Fahrenheit, right at the cusp of a phase transition you get something called separation, phase separation. You get blocks of, ice and pool, blocks of ice and pools of liquid. And then you get the molecules shuttle back and forth between them. And that's what Vannevar Bush did in the federal government. Mm-hmm. He created a group of wacky scientists completely separated from the soldiers, and he gave them their own system and ways of working, which were totally different, almost the exact opposite of the soldiers. One was non-hierarchical, one was extremely hierarchical. And the reason separation is so important is because these two groups, the ones working on crazy ideas and the ones working on tight discipline and timelines and on time, on budget, speak different languages. So here's what I mean by that. The English word risk. It's one word, four letters. You would think it would mean the same thing to everybody, but it doesn't. Mm -hmm. If you are a soldier and you're going into a high risk battle, that's a very bad thing. If the commander succeeds in de-risking that battle, his general will tell him, great job, you've taken the risk out of that battle. Mm -hmm. Now imagine going to an artist and saying, wow, you've really taken all the risk out of your art. That's Mm -hmm. a terrible thing to tell Mm -hmm. an artist. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Right? Now, if you're an artist, you want to work on 10 crazy things and, you know, nine of them won't work and then the one that does is the winner. That's fantastic. That's how you try to work as an artist. You're You're pushing the envelope as an artist. Now, if you're a soldier, let's say your job is to manufacture planes, you don't want to sit back in an armchair and say, let's just launch 10 planes in the sky and see which nine fall down. <laughs> and hope for the best. No, we don't want that. <laughs> right. So that's why these the, the, they speak different languages. And so the first rule, one of the first things you need to do is separate your artists and your soldiers. And that could be separating them by role or by building or by – or if it's the same group of people, it means separating artist time and soldier time. Mm. At incredibly mindfully. In other words, that might mean the same team is focused six months of the year on delivering on time, on budget, on spec, and then one week every few months, every six months, or whenever it is, or even every month, one week, mm-hmm. that team takes time out, mm-hmm. throws away the sort of on time, on budget mentality, and throws away, let's worry about reducing risk, and does exactly the opposite. Let's think of the craziest possible ideas. Let's think of the riskiest possible ideas. What are they? It just goes for quantity rather than quality. Mm. And then at the end of that little break, that little artist time, you put back on your soldier hat and you say, all right, now we're going to pick the top three ideas and march the rest of the way down the field. So that's one of the things that comes out of these ideas. Just one, There's a whole series of things you want to do to create a system and a structure for innovating faster and better. But one of them is the idea that you have these separate artists and soldiers, whether it's separate in time or separate in people. And you want to understand that, manage that. And just as importantly, if you're a manager or leader, you need to learn how to love your artists and soldiers equally. If you if you favor one side or the other, 
you're going to have a problem. Well, that made me think of Steve Jobs. Tell that story because that uh, at the beginning he was um, not so much. Well, you tell the story of Steve Jobs because I think that's what popped into my brain brain when you were saying that. Right, and that that's one of the things. This idea that the need to love our artists and soldiers equally is so important right now because so many popular stories and magazine articles lionize the creators, the innovator, the people who are allegedly the visionary innovators who are having, who are the artists. And the re, and that Steve Jobs is often held up as an example of that, but the reality is almost the exact opposite of the myth. What really happened was in the first in Steve Jobs' first time at Apple, when he was in his 20s and had started it with Wozniak, he was, in fact, seeing himself as the ultimate artist. And uh, he, he called his group that was working on the Macintosh the Pirates. And the group that was working on the next version of the Apple II that had been their successful core product, he called that group the regular Navy, the regular soldiers. Mm-hmm. And he created so much hostility between those two groups that the the building they were in separate buildings and the street between their two buildings was called the DMZ the demilitarized zone mm. and he would call those guys working on the franchise bozos and they took to wearing <laughs> you know buttons with a bozo yeah. the clown and a red sash through it saying we're not bozos but the dysfunction was so bad that people on both sides started leaving and the mac when it was eventually released the first time, it had a great publicity campaign with the legendary ad, the Super Bowl ad, but it was a flop as a product. It was uh, too slow, it was underpowered, it overheated, and sales went down to almost nothing. But it had done such a job in pissing off the rest of the organization, the, the core franchise that was making 90, 95% of the revenue of the company, uh-huh. that so many of them left. And when it came time for the Apple III and the next products, those did really poorly as well. And the company nearly went bankrupt. And in fact, it was John Scully who came in and helped turn some things around. Saved the day, yeah. Right. And so when he was doing this sort of classic case of loving and lionizing the artists and dismissing the soldiers. And that was a disaster. When he came back 12 years later, who did he appoint as his chief designer, the ultimate artist, Johnny Ive, who designed, Mm -hmm. if you have an Apple product on your wrist or in your pocket, he probably designed it. And who did he appoint as the chief soldier, as head of operations? It was a guy named Tim Cook, who in his previous job, at Compaq, had been called the Attila the Hun of inventory. <laughs> yeah. And if there if there's a better name for a soldier inside a company, I don't know it. Yeah, there you go. And he had learned to balance, to love both his artists and his soldier equally. And when he died, who got the job? Was it as his successor? Was it the artist? No, it was the soldier, Tim Cook. Wow. <laughs> The uh, book is Loon Shots, How to Nurture the Crazy Ideas that Win Wars, Cure Diseases, and Transform Industries. Um, We don't have time to go into all the depth of the book. The book is extraordinary in his ability to connect these phase transitions and the equilibrium and uh, how to do both. Uh, It is absolutely, um, I heard someone else describe this book as one of the most important books, business books for 2019. I would agree with that. Lessons I've got from here are just awesome. Um, and you can find more about the book at loonshots.com. And you can find uh, Safi at, at, on Twitter at uh, S-A-F-I-B-A-H-C-A-L-L. So let's finish up this way. Uh, I introduced you, and you are a physicist. But as we started to talk, you said, well, I'm also an entrepreneur. Uh I struggle with that. How did you bridge that? Talk to me about the insights that that you gained through that transition or the bridge, I guess. Well, I think the uh, I, I had grown up as an academic. I uh, both my parents were scientists, so I don't think I set foot off a university until I was age twenty nine or mm. thirty. And I I just got curious about what the rest of the world did. I, I I, you know, I realized at some point that it was probably the case that what me and the people that I knew and were speaking to 
were a pretty slim majority and that in fact the vast majority of the world was not theoretical physicists and mathematicians and they did something during the day <laughs> and that and the something that they did during the day seemed to make the world go around <laughs> so I was pretty curious about what they did and that's how the good. world worked that's and good. that's kind of led me out of basic research and into figuring out how the world works yeah that's that's fascinating uh, folks, you want to read this book. Uh, some older folks will re recognize the name Pan Am. I love that story. And if you're interested in James Bond, you're going to see that story and how it connects to what we've talked about today. Just an incredible, incredible book. So anything we didn't talk about, you want to take a minute or two to, to close up, or do we kind of cover the key points in a short interview? Well, I think I could, you know, there's a final word I might sure. say that has stayed with me for a long time, and that came from working with a guy named Judah Folkman. So I you know, mentioned I'd been in cancer research and drug discovery, and Judah was a remarkable scientist. He had been uh, head of surgery at Boston Children's Hospital, and he came up with an idea when he was a young man. And his idea was pretty radical at the time. And the idea was that tumors require blood vessels to grow. The tumors somehow, when he had he'd seen this when he operated on patients, that the tumors seemed to be surrounded by these blood vessels, and he just never read about it in any of the textbooks at the time, which were all about treating patients with chemotherapy, you know, poisoning, poisoning them and the tumors, or, or radiation, just kind of burning the tumors. Yet he said, well, if these tumors are surrounded by blood vessels, it's like when you're, they're building a house and they need to lay down pipes. Suppose we block the pipes. Wouldn't that stop the tumors from growing? And everybody said, no, that's absurd. You don't understand what you're doing. And he was ridiculed. He was dismissed. They said, oh, that's just inflammation or irritation. And you can't, the idea that they're sending out these mysterious signals to bring, bring workers over to lay down some pipes, that's crazy. And he was dismissed or ridiculed for 32 years. He suggested the idea in 1971 until in 2003, a scientist at, a, at the major cancer conference at a keynote presentation pressed a button, flipped a slide showing that the largest trial in colon cancer to that time demonstrated unequivocally that patients who received the drug based on Judah's ideas lived longer than anyone had ever lived before, patients with mm. metastatic colon cancer. And he became... You know, a hero overnight, and that drug has been has made an enormous difference. That drug and drugs like that has made an enormous difference in the lives of tens and hundreds of thousands of patients. It's helped actually reverse blindness. It's been treated in the, given in the eye. It can help eliminate this overgrowth of blood vessels that causes a an important eye disease, and it makes blind people see. So it's helped millions of lives. And uh, in the final years of Judah's life. Uh, I asked him at one point at a dinner, how did you persist? You know, he was asked to step, to resign. He was kind of, uh, as chief of surgery, he was, uh, all his grant proposals was rejected. There were major articles about his work couldn't be reproduced. I asked Judah, how did he persist when everyone told him his idea could never work? And he told me something that has always stayed with me, which is there are no experts of the future. Hmm. There are no expert experts for the future. You want to get this book, folks. It's Loon Shots, How to Nurture the Crazy Ideas that Win Wars, Cure Diseases, and Transform Industries. You can go to loonshots.com to learn more. Safi, thank you so much for being part of the Business Builder Show, and congratulations on a fantastic book. Thanks. It was uh, delightful to be here. Thank you so much for listening to The Business Builder Show. To learn more about me, and I'm Marty Wolf, go to MartyWolfBusinessSolutions.com. That's MartyWolfBusinessSolutions.com. To learn more about Kelly Hoey, go to her website, which is jkellyhoey.co. That's jkellyhoey.co. And, of course, you can find Kelly and Marty on LinkedIn and Twitter. A reminder, you can find all our Business Builder Shows on iTunes, Spotify, and on your favorite a podcast app bringing the business classroom to you it's the business builder show with marty wolf